understand why uh, the Bible was written the way it was written and who the Bible, who God used to write the Bible and then um, how it breaks down for you and I or anybody in any age. And if you can learn to uh, find the divisions that are properly given in the Word of God, you will be light years ahead of the average casual Bible reader. And things will begin to make good sense. Matter of fact, more sense than they've ever made before in your life. So I've entitled uh, lesson number one, In the Beginning, because we want to start in the beginning. And uh, we started a Bible institute here some, probably a year now, I don't know. Who's your hero three years ago? <laughs> oh, okay. Three years ago, Jeremiah's helping me out. Pastor Tom wanted to do that. We got that up and running, and uh, we did that for a while till this epidemic thing caught us, and we kind of took a furlough, and I thought, you know what? We could begin to incorporate this back into our structured service. So this morning, you are at Hoosier Hills Bible Institute 101, and we're going to start a series of lessons for that class. It's our Sunday school hour, but we have to teach the Word of God, obviously, no matter where we're at, so that's why I've chose maybe to, to format this into more like the institute and bring the lessons and hopefully be a blessing to you and maybe our class will grow a little bit just from uh, people hearing uh, what's going on. And another reason is the, these, this series of lessons will be posted on YouTube channel and wherever else they put them and so that makes it handy. But this chart is simply on a bed sheet drawn with a or not a repetograph, but a Sharpie pencil or Sharpie pen, ink, and that's it. And some charts that I found over 25 years ago, and uh, I've adapted them to these lessons, and uh, I've uh, used them throughout the years. Uh, my daughter-in-law's here and my granddaughter's here. They probably remember the first charts that we had at uh, First Baptist Church in Blooming Grove, and they spun all the way around the church. Our church wasn't this big, and we had that chart, people would come in there and they say, what in the world is going on here? And, uh, you know, graphic, we're graphic, we're, we're graphics, we, we like graphics. Uh, you can't live, you cannot live without that cell phone and that Facebook page. Come on now, I'll teach you in a minute. You can't live without that TV on, huh? Now look, I have a checkbook in one pocket. And I have a cell phone in the other pocket. If I lose my checkbook, I don't even care. Boy, if I lose that cell phone. <laughs> hey, have you seen my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? I don't, what is that? I don't know. Times are changing. Times are changing. So <laughs> this morning, um, in the beginning, Bible Revelation of the Ages, Hoosier Hills Bible Institute, the great plan and purpose of God is often spoken of as the simple gospel. And, and that's true. Uh, so simple that none, no man, no person need err in its simplicity and its truth. Now, think about that. That's, God made salvation so simple that if you should hear the plan and the Spirit bear witness to that plan, and He will, that you shouldn't miss getting saved, especially not in America today. For the entrance of God's word bringeth light. Brother, when that word goes out, it begins to illuminate. And, uh, and truly, the, the first revelation that illuminate the seeking soul is simple, clear-cut, non-biased, very familiar, most familiar, truth, uh, above all things, that's the plan of salvation. And if I could teach all this stuff, get it backwards and forwards, rightly divide my Bible, and do all those things and fail to tell somebody how to get saved, I've missed the whole point of what's going on here today. This may seem overwhelming when you see all the charts and all the verses and everything, but believe me, once a person gets saved, they're like a newborn babe. They desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. 
And just as pastor gave testimony when he began to study the word of God, some people get saved early and study late. And, and that's okay. And, but it still does, has the same effect. It causes you to grow, causes you to want to feed, causes your soul to be refurbished. So that is our goal. And John 3.16 is a cornerstone verse for the most important thing uh, that you ever learn from the Word of God. For, and everybody knows the verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you realize that's probably the first verse of Scripture I ever remember memorizing? And then possibly my mother taught it to me. I'm not sure. But I would say she did because I remember trying to quote it uh, when I was a pretty small child, before I ever got saved. And then I got saved later. But that verse speaks about God. If you see on my little chart, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Brother, if you don't get that thing right, God, you won't get nothing right. So there's enough gospel or good news, we call it the good news, in this one declaration, John 3, 16, in this one declaration of truth to give every last one of Adam's race a passport to heaven. And people say, wow, you know, if I, I, and we live in America and you can buy a Bible about any dime store. It used to be a dime store. Now it's a dollar store, I guess. And, uh, but you can still find them and we get them and we buy them. We find a King James Bible, we buy them, we give them away so on and so forth. But uh, that's interesting. But here, a uh, passport to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ, the finished work, which happens way late in history. And if you were to look at that uh, chart, possibly next to the last chart, you will find the crucifixion, maybe the third chart, you will find the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ of glory. But something I hadn't said anything about is I'm going to talk this morning briefly about the seven days of creation or the six days, seven days that God set aside. And I won't get into chart number two, but chart number two, that big old black hole in there is what's wrong with mankind. That's called the fall of man. But as soon as you get past that fall and you see the curse and that thing, there's a thin red line. And I just checkerboarded it that goes all the way through that chart, all the way through, all the way through, all the way through. And that, that thing represents the promise. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he talked about the seed that would come. And brother, that seed goes from there all the way through that thing, all the way through uh, the Noah's, Noah's period, the Tower of Babel, right on through, all the way to the cross where that seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the focal point of this whole thing is is to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word that He put together for us. So here, and, and in saying this, after accepting the simple gospel, we soon find ourselves in the depths of two great mysteries. Let me say this. I thought this is important to say at this time. Because once you get saved, now if you're a child, I understand. You're, hey, I'm going to heaven. It's good. All's good. And you don't know. I didn't know. Somebody say, you going to heaven or hell? I'm going to heaven, man. I got saved, but I couldn't tell you nothing else about anything else because I didn't know anything else. And it's possible to be saved and not have any Bible knowledge or understanding because you have the knowledge of good and evil and you've trusted Christ and heard that simple plan and gotten saved. And I feel like that's probably one of the problems in the churches across the ages today. People get saved, they become casual readers of the Word of God, and they're not students of the Word of God and then um, they don't know anything about what's going on while we're here, why, why this is going on. Now, uh, brother, uh, Mr. Pence had a fly bothering him. That thing came to church with me today. Now, I guarantee this won't go viral, but anyway, that fly is swarming in here. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, after accepting the simple gospel truth, getting saved, uh, it isn't long till a person grows up in the Lord just a little bit. We find ourselves in the depths of two great mysteries. And the one is the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. If you can maintain that thought, those are the two things that will cause you more issues and more troubles and more problems as a Christian uh, because you'll be pulled toward the, the mystery of iniquity and not understand it. 
But the Holy Ghost of God will try to pull you toward the mystery of godliness, which the Bible speaks of. We taught a whole series of lessons on the seven mysteries in the Word of God, or eight or nine, or however many you want to find. The Bible is the most profound book accessible to man. You don't, just stop and think about that for a moment. We've got books laying over here. We've got books here. A lot of them song books. But you go into any library and look at the books in our little library here uh, in Denver County. Uh, and there's tons of books and tons of books and tons of books. You get online. There are tons of books and tons of books if you shop online. But here the Bible is the most profound book accessible to man. Number one some things about the Bible that make it profound. It was not written all at one time. Uh, well, there you say there's plenty of books that have been written on, not like the Bible. Uh, it took 1,500 years to complete the Bible. So from Genesis 1-1 to the last chapter and the last verse of the book of Revelation at the end chart, there's 15, at least a span of 1,500 years uh, to write that history and that wisdom that God pinned down. It has, it has 40 Holy Ghost-inspired writers. They, they were not men of uh, secular education. They were men of God. So the Bible is the most profound book accessible to man, so that's why it's fun to study it. That's why it yields more to mankind than any other book on the face of the earth. It has more truth, uh, more sense to the same man than any other book. So there's no shortcut to profitable Bible study. People, I mean, I, okay, I got saved. I read the Bible through one time. I got it. I'm good. I, you'll never exhaust this book. It's a supernatural book. We put the emphasis on the Word of God here at Hope Baptist Church, as many other Bible-believing churches do. Do we live by every jot and tittle? No, we're just human like anybody else, but at least we have the good sense to know it is the, the infallible, inerrant Word of God. And I speak of the King James Bible, the AV 1611. So here it is, when you study the Scriptures, when you try to learn something about what God has recorded for us and set forth before us, it is accomplished by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And we got that uh, from the teachings of the Apostle Paul. We got that from the prophet Isaiah. We got that from the man David. And let me choose one. Let's go with Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 13. It's not on the chart. This is kind of preliminary to get me started to teach, teach these things. In Isaiah 28, verse 13, the Bible says this, But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. You say, what is that? That's Scripture with Scripture. And brother, it was said already before I began the class, but pastor, that the best commentary on the Word of God is the Word of God. Yeah. We were taught in Bible classes when we took Bible classes a hundred years ago, it's okay to read these other books. It's okay to study other men's ideas. But you better keep your Bible in one hand and then that, that, that book you got in the other and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you through the truth because every writer, every man, anybody on the face of the earth except the writers of the Word of God are subject to make mistakes and errors. But the Holy Spirit of God, who is our real teacher, never makes any mistakes. And when he's saying, you're looking at this guy's work and say, well, he said this one over here. Let's see. But the Bible says over here, and the Holy Ghost says, yeah, stick with the Bible. And so you've learned something, but you've also learned you can trust the Word of God. So uh, that, that's our, for, our forefront, our format for ever studying the Word of God. Well, then will the Spirit that reveals and the Word that is written agree? That's the only time it will if you compare Scripture with Scripture. Uh, so to get the best out of the Bible revelation, we must be students of the Word of God, which I'd like to think that we are. My thrust in my life and my ministry has been to teach the Word of God. I'm a preacher. I love preaching the Word of God. 
But there's something about teaching the Word of God that is so necessary in these late days that we live. You say, why? Well, number one, it'll help you to be a better Christian. Number two, it'll help you be a better witness. Number three, it'll prepare you if God should call you to go someplace to minister. It'll help you. Um, so that's our thrust. So here, there's nowhere a basic background that is once seen, even though dimly will make the revelation that follows much easier to understand than that principle of going verse by verse. And although it is a dark background, sometimes people say, well, you know, I can't understand all this. I can't get it all. It's the Holy Ghost of God that illuminates and gives you illumination through some of the harder areas or darker areas. It throws much light upon the eternal plan and purpose of God for you personally, for church collectively, however you want to look at it. I like systematic theology. You say, what's that? You start at point A and go to point B, and from point B to point C. You say, why? Because it speaks of structure. It speaks of we're laying some, every class you've ever been in, any school, any place, they had some kind of structure to that thing. When you stepped into the first grade, you begin to learn your ABCs, if, if you're in America. Uh, then you begin to learn your numbers. And they had a structured system whereby they teach uh, Bible teachings the same way, God's the same way. I don't know if you've never picked this up before, but God is a God of order and structure. Now, not so much that the Holy Spirit can't have His way. And you always want that. That's the spiritual side of things. And I told you, you'd struggle with that mystery of godliness. People say, oh, I don't know if that's of God or not. Well, look, if it lines up with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God, but it doesn't line up with humanism and the humanistic teachings and feelings of the day, it's probably right because it lines up with the Word of God. Amen. Amen. So in the beginning, our study of Bible revelation, we would start with, number one, the creation of the material universe. And I use that word loosely. Um, so, okay, we're going to start with Adam and Eve. That'd be, uh, uh, that'd be way over here. Because man doesn't show up on the first day. He doesn't show up on the second day. He doesn't show up on the third day. But on the fourth day, he begins to show up. So you say, well, we'll start in the beginning. Now, follow this because I don't, I don't want to, I won't stay long on these thoughts. But when you start a comprehensive study of Bible revelation of the ages, the creation of material universe does not start with Adam and Eve. I got them over there, and there's the first of Scripture on the bottom of that, which I can't see from this distance. Genesis 2, 19 through 25 is that thing. You say, well, what happened before Adam and Eve? More than you think. <laughs> you say, what? Yes, when God began to create the heaven and the earth, and remember the timeline that Brother Bob put up? And he had a timeline, he put it up that night, he preached Sunday night, he went through that thing. And he was dealing with time. Before time starts, and time's only marked in the Word of God by humanity and the creation, and we get a time scale, we get days of the week, there was already eternity. Amen. You say, what? Yeah, well, God was still in, already in existence. God has always been. God always will be. And so to get a grip, and we live in time, so we're like a guppy in a fishbowl. Huh? One of them little black fish is swimming all over the place. And if you get too many of them in there, they eat each other. Which is a bad analogy, I guess. But God was before all that. So if you're going to start and think, and this chart starts with just in the beginning, Genesis 1.1. But before that... There was a God. There is God. There was the Lord Jesus Christ. So the creation of the material universe, Adam and Eve, we might say, the temptation and the fall, which is pictured on the second chart, we're not really prepared for serious study of the... I want to choose my words wisely. Uh, could I use the word origin, place, purpose, and destiny of man until we know something of the origin 
nature, office, and purpose of another and earlier order of created spirit beings known by the familiar name, now don't, don't let me rock your boat, angels. Angels were created before man. Now, you say, well, well that, that, that didn't happen. Wait, wait a minute. I want to start in Genesis 1-1. We will. I just want you to have a grip on the origin, purpose, place, significance of God. We hold him to the finite knowledge that we have in our little brain. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm the son of Adam, and I'm, I'm here now, and I'm, everything's good, and the whole world revolves around me. No. No. Oh, the whole universe revolves around it. No, no. There's a whole lot more going on than just Adam and Eve before the creation in Genesis 1 1. Oh, but what I'm trying to get you to see is how awesome God really is. And we won't spend a lot of time with that. And believe it or not, I have a chart on that. But man, we're probably not ready for that one yet. I would rather preach on the Revelation one. Amen? <laughs> yeah, I see it clear. Man, it's hard for me to look back because there's not a lot in the Word of God, but there are some things. So here, uh, if we get a grasp on how awesome God is or the nature and office and purpose of uh, another, and or we just think about the fact that we are not the first created creatures that God created. There was an angelic force created before us. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about that. Because you know, people teach on the gap theory, pro-com. It's just that, a theory. Because God chose not to give us a lot of light on it. But he did give us a lot of light on Genesis chapter 1 to Revelations chapter 22. Amen. And we struggle with just getting our mind wrapped around that. So uh, here this morning, I want you to know that there's a lot going on before God ever, ever started the creation of the universe. So it's important to know something of their relation to God, or these, this angelic host, just a little, uh, to man and to the world, for it was through one of their number, let me make this point, I'll just make this point, through one of their number, a fallen, cast-out angel, that man was seduced to sin against the Creator. You see, <clears throat> on chart number two, which we're not looking at this morning, I have a serpent drawn right before the fall, and that serpent's representation of the devil himself. You say, what is he? Well, you got your Bible there. We'll lay this groundwork down, and that'll set the stage to be able to teach this stuff. Satan, that old serpent, the devil. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says it like this. Now, the serpent was more subtle, subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And we are very familiar with those passages because it's the Word of God. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 2, and I told you we're going to take it from Genesis to Revelation. We'll try to fill in the blanks. Not all in one lesson, obviously. But in verse 2 of chapter 20, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So the serpent shows up in Genesis chapter 3, uh, and then he shows up in Revelation, and he's always identified as that old serpent, or the devil, or Satan, or if you please, Lucifer himself. You realize he was around before Adam and Eve was ever created? Now, didn't I tell you that once you get saved, there will be some questions arise in your adult life, maybe not in your child life, because children don't ask these kind of questions, but adults could if they get around Bible teaching or Bible preaching. And I said that you would, you would have questions about the, great, the, the two great mysteries, and there are seven mysteries, but the two great mysteries that you'll have to deal with personally is the mystery of iniquity, that old serpent, and the mystery of godliness, the Holy Ghost of God in you. Amen. And if you can get that, that stuff nailed down now as we go through these lessons, you'll say, well, okay, uh, I got a grip on this. So the first and most natural question that arises is, where did he come from, that, the devil? Where did he come from? And with, with evil, where did he come from? And with evil in his heart. 
Well, God created him. But he was so uh, magnificently made, God as he made us with his own will. And brother, when you give something its own will, it just might not want to do what God says. Amen. <laughs> now that's nothing new to us, is it? Because we're from the Adamic race. We are born without a spirit of God in us because of the fall. And that spirit must be put in us by the Holy Ghost of God when you get saved. So here, now we are faced with, to face with the great twofold mystery we've been talking about just a little this morning. Another order of created being already evicted from the creation of man, and I'll give you a verse or two in just a second, the great mystery that before man's perfect creation, evil, rebellion, discord already exists in the universe that was spoken into being by the perfect word, John 1, 1, Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3. We won't turn this morning. I'm laying the groundwork for the classes. But it talks of Christ Jesus being the creator God. But I like the verse of uh, Isaiah records in Isaiah 14, 12, and he's talking about this anointed cherub that covereth. He's talking about that one that was created before Adam and Eve was created. He's talking about that one that shows up in Scripture, Job chapter 38, the sons of God shouted out uh, at the creation and the foundation of things being put. But there was something going on before, and I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it. I just want you to know how big God is and that plan of God might be a little bigger than sometimes we think, but thank God for the plan of salvation that we have today for us. You say, well, how many plans does God have? We probably don't have time in this segment to talk about after the millennial reign of Christ. Amen? But there's another plan found out in the Word of God. You say, wow. So all you need to focus on this morning is right now and who you are and what you are and what you can learn that you might reach others for the cause of Christ. But Satan, Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That's, that's the devil. That's the serpent. Son of the morning. He was a bright, shining thing. How art thou cut down to the ground, which dost weaken the nations? And he was, you say, what happened? Well, pride was found in him. In Isaiah chapter 5, he said, I will arise. He said, five times I will arise before the very throne of God. You say, what happened to him? Well, he had his own will. God created him such a magnificent creature. He looked and appeared to be the anointed cherub that covereth. And he was angelic. And he had, if you please, superpower. Amen. Before man was ever, ever created. And then uh, in Ezekiel, he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I was quoting that. That's Ezekiel 28, 14, 15. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of the fire. Thou wast but perfect in the ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Say, what happened? Remember when I told you when we started the lesson, you're going to deal with two things here. The mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. So it's kind of been my cornerstone here this morning. So right now, I'm trying to help you understand the mystery of iniquity. And um, the mystery of iniquity started way before Genesis chapter 1-1. One, one. We just start getting the record at the pen of Moses in Genesis chapter 1-1, one, one, and he writes all the history. The first five books of the Bible are a history. And by the way, the book of Genesis is so put together that if you get the principles and precepts of the book of Genesis and even the numerology, not even talking about the, the theology, if you get the numerology down, it is the format for understanding and getting a grip on the Word of God. Oh, you're one of those guys. You're going to chop it up into 100 pieces. No, I'm not an ultra-dispensationalist. I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist, but I am a dispensationalist. You say, why? Because God is a God of dispensations or time periods or ages. Yeah. There was an age before Genesis 1. There's this age that we're in. Hence, the title to my lesson today was simply uh, Bible Revelation of the Ages. And these courses are going to, uh, they're going to include uh, from Genesis to basically Revelation, an overview of simply understanding the Word of God through the concept 
of dispensational teaching. And the word dispensation is a word chosen by the Holy Ghost of God and penned in the book of Ephesians so that nobody can say, well, that word isn't even in the Bible. Yes, it is. And the definition is clear. You say, well, divisions, what are you talking about? This chart lays down the seven days of the week. God works by sevens. And I'm I keep looking back there. I keep looking over there. There's that clock. <laughs> Got it. So God works in order. And by the way, there are seven days in a week. There are seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelations. And we can go through the series of sevens all the way through. There's seven holes in your head if you don't have piercings. You got piercings, you got a couple more holes. There are seven bones in your ankle. Say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about God's going to take a period, and, and the Jew always counted by sevens, Gentiles count by tens, and the principle of sevens is set forth, and the number eight is the number of new beginning. If you study numerology, and they, they should be eight charts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight charts, and eighth is a picture of the new beginning, the millennial reign of Christ, that thousand years. So, man, hang on. We're in for a ride. Pastor, you got comments or anything this morning before I close out? All right. Let's pray. Thank you for the first class. And I'll be out next Sunday. I'm at Hope Baptist Church in uh, uh, Rushville, Indiana, preaching their homecoming up there. I apologize, so I won't be here next Sunday. And I'll take my chart because they want to hear some of this stuff too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for a chance to teach and preach your word. Bless our congregation, our singing, our preaching, our offerings, everything that we do. Uh, may it bless thee. In Jesus' name we, we pray. Amen. Amen.